It would have been <clears throat> the summer of 1996, and I was driving my 1980 old Cutlass sedan, much like the one pictured here, down East Leonard Avenue in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I passed uh, St. Alphonsus Catholic Church driving my Oldsmobile, green, 1980, as I said. It was a four-door. This is a two-door. I had a four-door. So I'm passing St. Alphonsus Church, and as I look at the church, I have this strong desire to stop the car, turn into the parking lot, get out, search through the parish, find a priest, and ask for confession. And that by itself might not be so unusual to you. Maybe you have, in the past, you know, driven by a Catholic parish or a shrine, and it's made you think, and it's come to mind that, boy, I need, I need to get to confession. There's some, something I need to get off of my chest. But what made it so unusual in my case, first of all, was that I wasn't Catholic, Secondly, I was the pastor of the Protestant parish three blocks down. And so the question arises, why would a Protestant pastor drive back by a Catholic church and want to go to confession? And so obviously there's a backstory to what was going on. But I was about, I was in about the third year of my ministry at a local uh, Protestant church, really more like about four blocks from St. Alphonsus. <coughs> and um, I was preaching a sermon series on the book of James. Now, you know, in Protestant groups, you don't have the lectionary, so you don't have much of a guide in terms of what to preach on on any given Sunday. And uh, yeah, sure, you can just pick a new text every Sunday and preach on it, but after a while, you kind of run out of all your favorite texts, and it kind of leaves you a bit directionless. So I did what many Protestant pastors do, and I adopted the practice of doing sermon series. So I'd pick a book of the Bible and preach through that book. And I had done this on Philippians. I had done this on Ephesians. I believe I had done it on Galatians. And then I decided I would tackle the book of James. And the first four chapters went just fine. Until I got to James chapter 5, and I started to prepare a sermon on this chapter. And I ran stuck on this passage. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, this is a particular line that gave me trouble. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and to pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. So I'm... Prepare, trying to prepare a sermon for this on this passage for my little congregation of maybe 75 people on a Sunday morning. And I had very little oversight in downtown Grand Rapids. I had a pretty free hand to do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, I was very committed to the literal sense of the scriptures. And I was committed to the idea of a New Testament church. So I had this freedom with this little parish to kind of go in what direction we wanted to go in. And I wanted to revive just the church of the Bible. Amen? Just, just apply the scriptures directly. Just do exactly what they said. No mediating tra uh, tradition. No mediating theology. Just put into effect the word of God. Well, I'm working on this text. I'm like, okay, so 
how are we going to put this into effect at my little parish? It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. So how am I going to implement mutual confession of sin? And I'm like, okay, maybe we can pass a mic on the Sunday morning service. All right, it's confession of sin time. Here we go. You know, who's first? You know? Like, oh, gee, that's not going to work. You know, that's going to give scandal. First of all, probably nobody's going to participate. And anybody who does participate, they're just going to do, they're just going to confess some sanitized sins. They're like some socially acceptable sins, like maybe, I don't know, lose your temper or something like that. Occasionally, like, who doesn't do that, right? And uh, we're not really going to get into anything deep. And if we did get into something deep, it would cause scandal and, and trauma, and, uh, and there would be no confidentiality. I mean, if somebody mentioned something in the, in the church service, it would be on the streets by Monday morning. So I could just think of all kinds of problems with that. So I'm racking my brain, and like, okay, passing a mic on Sunday morning is not a good idea. Well, maybe small groups. There we go. Yeah, everybody, break up into groups of three or four and confess your sins to one another. I can see that's going to go really well. You know, there's going to be a teenager and a church elder and a single mom, you know, and, and a retiree in a, in a, in a foursome. And uh, ugh, I, don't know, I don't even want to think about it, you know. <clears throat> Again, people are not gonna, they're not gonna be forthright, or if they are forthright, it's gonna cause trouble. Then probably, you know, this is another problem, bad counsel. Like I can see the teen saying something like, Oh, I did such and such this week, and somebody else saying, Oh, that's not really too bad. I do that all the time. Okay, great. Now I've morally malformed one of my teens because he's getting bad advice from some adult in the church. You know? So I'm just going through the options, and I'm not thinking of anything, you know? I'm not thinking of any way to do this. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. <coughs> and it was really starting to disturb me. All the ways that I could think of to try to implement the confession of sin in my Protestant church would involve the problems of scandal, bad counsel, lack of confidentiality, shame, and just silent non-participation. Like, how, how are we really going to do that? And then, but, you know, again, I was committed to New Testament Christianity and putting into effect the Word of God and just doing exactly what it says. So I was really struggling with this, and as I was trying to figure out what to say about this text, to my congregation, I began to reflect on what I knew about Catholicism. And of course, most of my information came about Catholicism came from where it does for most people, which is movies, of course. So I'm thinking back to all you know, the you know, Catholic themes and, and practices that I see in movies, and that's where I got my information about confession. And so I'd seen movies where confession was portrayed. And so I knew a little bit about the practice of the sacrament. And I began to think to myself, you know, Catholics actually have a good way of putting into practice what it says here in James 5.16. <coughs> the way I saw it, Catholics would go to their pastor, and their pastor was the spiritual head of the congregation. So when they confessed to their pastor, it was like confessing to the congregation since he was the spiritual head. But they did it in such a way that it was confidential. And then since the pastor had been to seminary and had some formation, uh, spiritual and theological formation, he was not likely to give them bad counsel. And I knew a little bit about like the seal of the confessional, right? Because that Hitchcock movie, right? I confess, you know, it was all about that. So I knew a little bit about that. And so like, and, and he's bound, I know they take that really seriously. He's bound not to reveal what happens. And so you don't have that problem of shame or lack of confidentiality. 
And I began to really admire the way that, you know, as I thought it, oh, Catholics had come up with a way of fulfilling what James 5.16 says and having a way to confess their sins to the congregation in the person of their pastor. And then I began to reflect on my own personal life and the, the ways that I, excuse me, the ways that I, you know, kind of needed healing. It says, confess your sins, pray for one another that you may be healed. And I thought, well, that's probably not just physical healing, that's probably also spiritual healing. And in several ways, I have plateaued in my spiritual growth. You know, got stuck in certain ruts that I did not seem to be able to get past. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe one of the reasons why I'm stuck and I'm not growing in my Christian faith is that I won't do what is stated here in James 5.16. I won't confess my sins to another Christian. And then I began to think, you know, well, who can I confess to? Okay, who could I even go to? I started to th- tick off the possibilities. You know, I could go to, go to somebody else in the church. Like, no, that would be awkward. I'm the pastor. Um, like, I could go to my mentor that was assigned to me from the seminary. I could go to, he was an older pastor. I could try to go confess to him. I'm like, no, well, he's signing my evaluations. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good good thing to give. My wife, no, no way, and I'm just gonna. <laughs> Homie, don't play that. Um, that's not gonna work. Um, and I'm not coming up with anything. And then finally I thought, you know what? I'm pretty comfortable with priests. Now there's a backstory to that. My dad was a Navy chaplain. And he uh, he always, for some reason, he always got a we- got along really well with the Catholic priest chaplains. In fact, one of his best friends was uh, Father John O'Connor, who later retired from the Navy, went on to become Bishop of Scranton, and then Archbishop and Cardinal of New York. A very close friend of my dad. And uh, so we, uh, when I was growing up, it was not uncommon for us to have priests over to the home for family dinner, because my dad would invite his chaplain friends home, especially when we were at um, the campus of Princeton University. My dad was going to school there for a year, and there were some uh, priest chaplains there as well that were getting degrees uh, funded by the uh, government. And uh, so they became good friends, and they'd come over to the house. And I got to know uh, a certain father, Sal, who was a precious blood father. And uh, so anyway, so I was pretty comfortable on a personal level with priests. And I began to think to myself, you know, Maybe, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should, you know, go, uh, you know, stop at St. Alphonsus Parish. And that's why I'm driving by and I see St. Alphonsus Parish there. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'll bet that if I stopped and went in and, uh, and went into the confessional and just said, uh, Father, I'm a Protestant, but uh, there's some things I need to get off my chest. You know, I figured he'd probably roll with it. You know, he'd probably roll with it, and I'm sure he wouldn't reveal anything uh, that was said in that conversation. So I'm beginning to think about, you know, seriously ponder doing this. But you know what? I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I drove right past St. Alphonsus, and, and this was the issue. Uh, I, o- I owned the only dark green Olds Cutlass. <laughs> The only dark green Olds Cutlass in town. And uh, sh- sure as shooting, if I uh, pulled into St. Alphonsus parking lot with that, with that sedan there, and one of my parishioners came by and saw Pastor John's car parked in the parking lot of a Catholic church, I would have some awkward explaining to do uh, the following Sunday. So I never got up the courage to do so. You know, I did go to the point of inviting that the priest who was pastor there for lunch. Uh, we had lunch together at a local restaurant. I tried to develop a relationship with him, hoping that at some point we'd get comfortable enough that I could, you know, get, uh, get into the confessional with him. Never happened. Anyway, there's some other scriptures. I want to, you know, just take a, a bracket 
you know, my, my personal story for a moment. And I want to delve into some other scriptures that at the time, back in 1996, um, I didn't realize were in there uh, or didn't realize their full implications, but only after coming into the church, which is about five to six years later, did these passages begin to really resonate with me. But first of all, Leviticus 5.1, I later came to realize that there was a sacrament of reconciliation in the Old Covenant under the Mosaic Law. And it was right in front of my nose. This was the book of the Bible that I did my doctoral dissertation on later in chapter 25. But here in chapter 5 of Leviticus, <coughs> it says, If anyone sins... When he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. Notice verse 5 that says he shall, when he confesses the sin he has committed. Now, the reason why a lot of folks don't get the full impact of this is because it's not explicit to whom must he confess. But when you read these passages and think about the implications, it begins to dawn on you that he had to confess to the priest, the priest that will make atonement for his sin at the end. Why is that necessary? Because it was the responsibility of the priest to make sure that he brought the right offering. You see, different sins require different kinds of sacrifices. And there was even a rough income gradation where, you know, if you were poor, uh, for various sins, you could just bring a couple of turtle doves, which is only worth a couple of pennies. But if you're kind of middle class, then you had to bring a sheep or a goat. And if you're a wealthy, you had to bring a bull. So you had to confess the, the, the sin that you had committed so the priest could know the gravity of it and what animal was therefore required and also kind of your income level and whether you are bringing the right sacrifice. And so there was confession to the priest in the Old Covenant, and it was the responsibility of the priest to make atonement and mediate the forgiveness of your sin. So if you sinned under the Mosaic Law, you did not go to the king because the king could not mediate the forgiveness of sins to you. You didn't go to the prophet either because a prophet did not mediate the forgiveness of sins. The only one who could convey to you the forgiveness of sins was the priest. And in order for that to happen, you had to bring the proper sacrifice for the deed that you had committed. So there was this uh, sacrament of reconciliation, let's call it, in the Old Testament. And then in John 2, 22, after our Lord has risen from the dead, it says concerning the apostles, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now in seminary, we were taught that this just referred to the preaching of the gospel, and that the apostles would go out and preach the gospel, and those that accepted the gospel would have their sins forgiven, and those who refused the gospel would have their sins retained. However, you can see that that's kind of Protestant eisegesis, okay? Exegesis is when you interpret a passage. Eisegesis is when you read stuff into the text. There's nothing about preaching in this text. It's not talking about the proclamation of the gospel. Now, other texts do talk about the proclamation of the gospel, but not this one. This text is talking about the forgiveness of sins, that the Holy Spirit is being given to the apostles to give them the power to do this. This is actually parallel to Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, both of which talk about the keys of the kingdom of heaven and binding and loosing. Uh, which had uh, different meanings, but one of the meanings was, uh, again, the forgiveness or the retention of sins. Uh, this was a power exercised by the priest in the Old Testament. When you would confess your sins, the priest would make a decision about whether you had 
properly perform the correct ritual for the forgiveness of your sins, offer the right animal in the right way, and then the priest would dispense uh, the forgiveness of sins. That role was usurped by the Pharisees in the time of Jesus. The Pharisees were um, adjudicating whether people could be uh, forgiven or not and whether they were obeying the law or not. And that was a major problem in first century Judaism. But Jesus invests his apostles with this authority. But I never pondered the implications of that. You know, uh, John writes this gospel at the end of his life. Um, why is he telling all his readers that Jesus gave the power to forgive sins to the apostles? He's the last apostle alive. Is he just saying, hey, you know, I'm about to die, but just wanted to let you know that Jesus gave us this superpower, <laughs> but I'm the last one with it, so <laughs> bummer, you know. Is that it? You know? No, I don't think so now. You know, John is aware that this power was shared with the early presbyters, the, those men that we now call priests, and the apostles appointed presbyters as their successors, and that apostolic ministry was carried on by the episcopoi and the presbyteroi, that is to say, the bishops and the priests who would follow in their footsteps. Let's look at another text. This is in Acts 19. I like this text because it shows the connection between confession and deliverance. So God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Shiva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, and gave them a sound drubbing, etc. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Many also of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. So the word of the Lord grew and prevailed mightily. Okay, look, there's a great spiritual revival in the city of Ephesus. And what sets off this revival is the confession of sins. Look at verse 18. Many also, those who are now believers, came confessing and divulging their practices, which included magic arts. This is not pagans who are practicing magic. These are Christians who are practicing magic, okay? This was moral corruption in the church. This was occultic activity going on within the body of believers. And that occultic activity was hampering the spread of the gospel. The spread of the gospel in this area had come to a plateau that they could not get beyond because this was going on. And the breakthrough only comes when the Christians come forward and come clean. And this, this has a, a powerful lesson for us. In, in the modern church, there are so many places in the world where the church seems to have no evangelistic power. The church just seems to be decrepit and, uh, and, and disappearing. And one of the problems in many of those places is there is moral corruption within the body of believers that goes unconfessed and unacknowledged. And as long as we as church don't come to grips with our own sins and with the sinful practices like contraception and divorce and cohabitation and abortion and many other things as well, pornography, etc., that is allowed to go on within the body of believers and it's just winked at and it's not addressed and it's not confronted and it's not acknowledged and it's not confessed, as long as it's going on, you can forget evangelistic power, okay? You can forget 
the power of the gospel because within the body of Christ, there is this blockage, okay? There's this impediment. It's as if the, you know, the, the conduit of the Holy Spirit is blocked by these unconfessed sins. But when the body of Christ comes clean and owns to what it has been doing, suddenly there is this great unleashing. All the great revivals in church history have been accompanied by the confession of sin. They've been accompanied by public repentance of sin. And we will know that we are having a true revival in the church when that comes to be again. Amen? Amen. So, but then we're talking about spiritual warfare here, okay? We're talking about evil spirits. We're talking about good versus evil. <coughs> we're talking about the gospel versus the forces of darkness. And the breakthrough comes through confession. And when he came to the other side, now we're going to look at another, because I want to talk about the reality of the demonic for a, for a moment. Okay, we're going to work into this. We're going to be talking about the spiritual warfare dimension of the sacrament of reconciliation. And first, I just want to lay down the foundation that evil spirits are real. This is not some kind of superstition that we haven't gotten over or some kind of fable in uh, the Bible that, uh, that we know better now that we have modern science or something like this, okay? This is extremely real. So let's look at some examples of the demonic from the Gospels. When he came to the other side, speaking about Jesus in Matthew 8, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demoniacs met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, what have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many swine was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of the swine. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the swine, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. All right, so... Look at here, we, we see some examples uh, that are the manifestations of the activity of demons. Supernatural strength. Okay, these two, two demoniacs are too strong to be overcome. And that is one of the supernatural uh, evidences of the presence of evil spirits. Also, the, um, the presence of other voices and persons who are speaking through a human's vocal cords and mouth, etc. So these, uh, these demoniacs are speaking, but it's evident to Jesus and the apostles that it's not the demoniacs speaking in their own person, but some, someone is speaking through them. It's this very weird phenomena. And that too is a sign of the presence of evil spirits. Now, a lot of intellectuals or self-styled intellectuals or academics uh, poo-poo this whole phenomena and just look down their nose at uh, the possibility of the reality of a spirit world and of evil spirits. And kind of a, a typical condescending opinion is expressed by Luigi Sartori, an Italian theologian that's uh, kind of... Uh, he's past the height of his career at this point, but um, one time very prominent. He said, It is probable that some of Jesus' healings involved individuals affected by nervous disorders rather than by true demonic possession. Okay, as if he would know. But, yeah, he goes, Wait, what? You were there? All right. <laughs> what? You were there? Huh? You saw? All right. But anyway, look at, but look at the Gospel of Matthew, for example. Look at what it actually says. He went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every infirmity among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So look at these different categories. They talk about the sick. They talk about people with different diseases and pains. 
they talk about people that don't have nervous control, you know, people that like epileptics and paralytics that don't have control over their body. So they knew a wide variety of phenomena, and they distinguish those nervous disorders and those physical disorders from having a demon. They knew the difference. And you might ask, well, how could they figure it out? Well, little subtle clues, things like, we know who you are. You're on the Holy One of God. Have you come to torment us before the time? That's not a symptom of epilepsy. That's not a respiratory infection. It's a little subtle things like that, you know, enabled them to distinguish. And they paid close attention. Okay, between, uh, between these various conditions. So my point is they knew the difference between, between illness and the demonic, and they distinguished the two. It's very clear, separate categories. The Catechism 414 says Satan or the devil and other demons are fallen angels who have freely refused to serve God and his plan. Likewise, Catechism 328 says the existence of angels both the fallen and the unfallen, is a truth of faith. Okay, this is, this is part of capital T tradition. This is part of the deposit of faith, is that there are such things as angels and demons. And the popes have been very clear about this. Um, uh, John Paul II uh, wrote this uh, in 1994. He says, may prayer strengthen us for the spiritual battle that the letter of the Ephesians speaks of. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Ephesians 6.10. The book of Revelation refers to this same battle, recalling before our eyes the image of St. Michael the Archangel in Revelation 12.7. Pope Leo XIII certainly had this picture in mind when, at the end of the last century, he brought in throughout the church a special prayer to St. Michael. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil, etc. Although this prayer is no longer recited at the end of the end of Mass, although in this area of the country, it's pretty much always recited at the end of Masses, but I think it's becoming a popular custom again. Anyway, he says, I, this is John Paul II now, says, I ask everyone not to forget it and to recite it to obtain help in the battle against the forces of darkness and against the spirit of this world. This is John Paul II, his Regina Taylor address, 24 April, 1994. And he wrote a lot more about, uh, about the, the, uh, the evil one and about spiritual warfare, and he also performed exorcisms. Now, uh, Benedict XVI spoke of the reality of the devil Pope Francis has been firm about this, much to the embarrassment of some of his uh, co-workers and assistants who uh, are among those who have disdain for this idea of a personal embodiment of evil for uh, a person like Satan. But Pope Francis has stood strong <coughs> on this teaching. <coughs> and many, many times in his pontificate has spoken of the reality of the devil Maybe some of you might say, but Father, how old-fashioned you are to speak about the devil in the 21st century. But look out, because the devil is present. The devil is here, even in the 21st century. And we mustn't be naive, right? We must learn from the gospel how to fight against Satan, Pope Francis says. Again, he says uh, at another address, the devil exists and we must fight against him. Paul tells us this. It's not me saying it. The word of God is telling us this. But we're not all convinced of this. Okay? He's being quite honest. He knows, he knows that uh, there's many bishops. He knows that there's many priests. He knows that there's large numbers of laity who don't take the devil seriously. And the Pope is urging us to, uh, to change our ways if that's how we think. Now, um, world-renowned psychiatrist M. Scott Peck, who uh, uh, was quite well-known uh, during my childhood, 
and uh, wrote several bestsellers, including one uh, from which this quote is taken, a book called People of the Lie, Hope for Healing of Human Evil, which really goes into the reality of the demonic, published in 1985. He talks about how, as a professional psychiatrist, he set about investigating whether there really was such a thing as evil spirits. And in the preface to his 1985 book, he wrote, five years ago when I began work on this book, I could no longer avoid the issue of the demonic because it was coming up in his psychiatric practice. I was left facing an obvious intellectual question. Is there such a thing as an evil spirit, namely the devil? I thought not. In common with 99% of psychiatrists and the majority of clergy, <laughs> he says, I did not think the devil existed. He's writing in 1985 and already he's saying, you know, the ma majority of clergy don't believe in the devil and almost all professional psychiatrists don't believe in the, in the devil. And neither did I five years ago. Still, he says, it occurred to me that if I could see one good old-fashioned case of possession, I might change my mind. So I decided to go out and look for a case. The first two cases turned out to be suffering from standard psychiatric disorders, but the third case turned out to be the real thing. And he goes on to describe that um, in his book and give references to other documentations of um, you know, historically documented exorcisms. So the devil is real, and uh, possessions are real, although uncommon, and other kinds of demonic activity is much more common than outright possession. And uh, I encountered the reality of evil spirits when I was working in Protestant ministry as an inner city evangelist uh, back in Grand Rapids, Michigan in the 90s. And so I was working in a downtown area of the city, a neighborhood that was rife with petty crime, with prostitution, with abortion, and with drug use. And people who are experienced in the spiritual battle, like Father Gabriel Amorth, the chief exorcist of Rome under the pontificate of John Paul II, folks like that will tell you where you get activities like uh, illicit drug use and prostitution and abortion going on, you're going to have the activity of evil spirits as well. They just go hand in hand with those kinds of behaviors. And sure enough, as I was doing urban ministry after, really after just a few months in my pastorate, I began to encounter people behaving in completely strange and irrational ways that didn't fall into any of the usual psychiatric categories that we were taught in the seminary. I began to encounter people who were having things going on in their homes that were inexplicable by, you know, the principles of science and this kind of thing. And, of course, I was completely unprepared to deal with it because my undergraduate degree had been in classical languages, which is Latin and Greek, okay? And then most of my seminary training was all just in the exegesis of the scriptures, so if there's dishes flying around in the homes and people are foaming at the mouth, all I can do is conjugate a Greek verb. <laughs> like about all I knew how to do. And that just was not what the situation called for. Now, thankfully, thankfully, um, one of my parishioners had a friend who was a deliverance minister. This is how we termed people who were, you know, essentially informal uh, exorcists within evangelical Protestant ministry. We, we call them deliverance ministers. And uh, one of my parishioners knew a deliverance minister who lived out in the suburbs outside of town. And she uh, arranged a meeting uh, between myself and this deliverance ministry. We'll, deliverance minister, we'll just call him Hank, uh, not his real name. And uh, I got to know Hank, and um, he, he inspired my trust, and I explained to him the kind of situations that I was encountering in urban ministry, and he said, okay, I, uh, I've seen the kinds of uh, phenomena that you're describing here. Why don't you take your parishioners out to me 
and uh, and I will pray with them, and and uh, we will we will do the the practices of deliverance ministry, and I think that they can be helped, and your congregation can be helped, and so that's what I began to do. And the, the first time I took someone out to Hank uh, to get uh, you know delivered. I was extremely nervous. Like, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. You know, we were going to go in there. Was he going to call up these spirits? And then this person was going to go into some kind of uncontrollable rage with superhuman strength. And their head starts spinning around. Their tongue starts sticking out three feet and all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, and scratching the walls and all these things that you see in the movies. I didn't know what to expect. So it was much to my relief when we got to Hank's house and I brought in my church member and there were a couple of other Christians there for prayer support uh, to be present and Hank was there and we just chit-chatted and had some soft drinks for a while and got comfortable with the environment and got comfortable with each other. And after that little introductory period, then Hank said, well, shall we begin? And I took a deep breath and said, well, I guess so. And so we sat down at the table and then the first thing that Hank did was pray, and he prayed to bind any spirits that were present, that they would not manifest themselves in the name of Jesus. And that was a big relief to me. I'm like, whoo, yeah, thank you. Let's bind them and let, you know, make sure they don't show themselves. And he, he prayed that. And then when that prayer was over, Hank took out a big three-ring binder. And in this three-ring binder were scores and scores of pages, uh, all in page protectors, you know, clipped into the, the three rings. And on these pages were lists and lists of sins. And they were categorized under seven major categories. And Hank would take that binary, he'd put it on the table, and he'd turn it around so it was facing the person who had come to be delivered. And he pushed it across the table to them, and said, okay, begin reading down this list, and if you come to anything that you've ever done, confess it and renounce it audibly in the presence of these believers. So we're basically doing something very similar to James 5.16. So he began to read through this list, and this took a long time because that binder was a couple of inches thick and just full of everything that Hank had ever encountered, ever read in the scriptures, ever seen in ministry, et cetera, put them all down there and categorize them in these seven different categories. And so the whole process took between two and three hours to work through. But the end of confessing and renouncing any sin that they had ever done, uh, the persons from my church were just like floating on, you know, the proverbial cloud nine, seemed like they were about six inches off the ground. They felt so light so free by the time they left, and the joy and the peace that was evident on their face was so remarkable that I'm like, I want that, you know? So I arranged, and I came back later and went through that whole process with Hank, and a lot of other members of my church did so as well, even those that weren't having, like, supernatural manifestations in their house, and we all benefited from that process. But what does that sound like to you? Hmm. Yeah, sounds like confession, yeah. But even more specifically, a, a rare practice that's largely fallen out of the church is a practice that we call general confession. Okay? A general confession is a lengthy confession where you make a very thorough inventory of your sins, and you take some, some special time to do that, it's something that you don't want to do on a Saturday afternoon with that one half hour that your parish schedules for confessions, right? And there's 15 people in line and you go in and want to do a general confession. No, you don't want to do that. Um, general confessions are actually highly recommended by various spiritual masters of the church, figures like St. Ignatius of Loyola, and St. Francis de Sales, you know, widely renowned for their spiritual wisdom, warmly recommend the practice of general confession, um, usually once a year to practicing Catholics in the context of a retreat. So Francis de Sales and Ignatius de Loyola both recommended making annual retreats for like a weekend, and then in the context of that retreat, 
when you have some leisure time and uh, the, the time to devote to it to make that thorough inventory and have a general confession. And they speak about the spiritual power that such a practice has. Well, my friend Hank was basically using a non-sacramental general confession to help free people from demonic power. And that, that actually follows Catholic theology because what that confession was doing was that it was eliciting perfect contrition from people, okay? It was helping to dispose people so that they had true contrition. And we know that you, if you have true contrition, you can receive the grace of forgiveness even without the formal sacrament. And that was what was actually taking place when people came with goodwill in that spirit of prayer, and that spirit was supported by their brothers and sisters, their baptized brothers and sisters in Christ. They were actually achieving the disposition of true contrition and being freed of their sins and, and especially being free from demonic power. So Father Amorth talks about this. I quoted this earlier today many times. I have written, he says, that Satan is much more enraged when we take souls away from him through confession than when we take away bodies through exorcism. And in another place, uh, in, in his second book with Ignatius Press, um, Father Amorth answered a, uh, a reader's question. A reader wrote in and said, my pastor claims the best exorcism is confession. And Father Amorth widely regarded as the most experienced exorcist in the Catholic Church at the time, writes, he is right. <coughs> it is the most direct means to fight Satan because it is the sacrament that tears souls from the demon's grasp, strengthens against sin, unites us more closely to God, and helps conform our souls increasingly to divine will. I advise frequent confession possibly weekly, to all victims of evil activities. Okay, Father Morth was a strong advocate of frequent confession. So am I, so is St. Jose Maria Escriva, who recommended weekly confession for lay people. His, uh, his teaching on that was um, uh, keep short accounts, is what uh, St. Jose Maria said, referring to the practice of accounting when you're a businessman and what you would reconcile your accounts and then retire and archive your accounts. So rather than letting your accounts get very long before reconciling and archiving, he said, keep them short. And that makes, makes, that is to say, make frequent reconciliations of your accounts before God um, in order to make progress in the spiritual life. Uh, again, Father Morth uh, writes in his book, An Exorcist, More Stories, in my experience, a good general confession which I always recommend as a starting point, in conjunction with an intense life of prayer and grace, is sufficient to end the afflictions. Without prayer and grace, exorcisms are ineffective. Okay? So what Father Morth is saying is, when people would come to him, he had, a he had great renown as an exorcist, and when people would come to him with spiritual difficulties, the first thing that he would do is a general confession. Okay? It was just like we had backed into by experience as Protestant deliverance ministers. This is where Father Morth would start with a general confession. And then usually that general confession uh, with uh, intense prayer uh, and, and frequenting the sacraments would be sufficient to end the problems that people were having. A for, he writes elsewhere that the, the formal exorcism was largely only necessary when people were so much in the grip of evil that they could not, they could not make a good confession. And when even a good confession was impeded, then they needed greater help from the church to get past that hurdle. But if they could confess the sins by which the demons had gained entrance, they could be free. And this is the way I understand it working. And I think I'm on sound theological basis here. But all sin has a spiritual warfare dimension to it. There is no sin that is just utterly passive 
in terms of the conflict between God and Satan. And when we, sin, when we sin, we are saying no to God and we are saying yes to the evil one. And sin amounts to a permission for the evil one to work in our life. Now, the evil one can cause external difficulties to be thrown at us, but he can't work inside of us unless we grant him permission. Is this making sense? Okay. It requires the cooperation of our will for the evil one to work inside. And we, we uh, grant that permission to him to work in us when we sin. Sinning is like accepting cookies on your browser. Okay, You're allowing that organization or that website or whatever to have access inside. Okay? to get a grip on you. And confession is like going into your system and denying all the permissions, all the access that you've granted to external entities to work within your system. Okay? So confession is very important in that way. Your re confession is a renunciation of the consent that you have given to the evil one to operate in your life. That's one of the things that it is. Now, you know, one of the manifestations, well, the particularly troubling manifestations of our tendency to evil is the phenomena of addiction, where we get caught up in a certain sin that seems to take control of our life. Addictions virtually always have a spiritual dimension to them which is why Bill Wilson found he could not get out of his addiction to alcohol without acknowledging God, and why classic 12-step programs begin with acknowledging your need for the grace of God. Uh, I have up on the, on the screen um, a website that I recommend. It's specifically designed for men uh, who are struggling to attain purity in their lives, but the principles given on that website are very, very useful and helpful for overcoming addictions of any kind, even kind of mild and annoying addictions, like getting addicted to, you know, watching sports or reading the newspaper or other things that actually take on an addictive character, uh, even though uh, they aren't what we usually think of as grave sins. So, that's a, a great website run by a Catholic psychiatrist by the name of Kevin Majors. Um, let's talk about a theology of confession together. Uh, the Greek word for confession is exhomologeo, and it's used in the context of both confessing sin and also confessing the faith, okay, in different senses. And ultimately, this term confession, ex homo legeo, means to admit the truth. It, etymologically, it means to say the same thing. Okay, well, to whom are you saying the same thing? Or who are you agreeing with when you confess? Well, you're agreeing with God, okay? You're saying the same thing as God, and you're calling your sins what God calls them, which is wrong and evil. And so you're agreeing with divine truth when you confess. The truth leads to freedom. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So this is the jubilee dimension of truth. And the confessional is the great moment of truth. When you walk into the confessional, what's going to take place there is pure truth. In a, in a situation of safety, you have the safety to admit what the truth is there before God and before the priest. And that truth is liberating. It is a personal jubilee. On the other hand, lies and evil create bondage. As Jesus says, you are, the, you are of your father the devil. He has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. There's something profoundly untrue about every sinful act. So confession is this great moment of truth 
which drives out the falsehood of the evil one that he uses to gain control of our behavior. And in confession, we manifest, that is to say, we demonstrate by our words and actions our own desire to be healed of evil. And this is key. God respects our free will. God created us to love him. Love cannot be coerced, otherwise it's not love. Love, by the very nature of itself, must be freely chosen. It must be a free and uncompelled act of the will. And be, therefore, God made us with free will, but the fact that our will is not compelled has the side effect that we can actually choose evil. And thus, any world in which there's the real possibility of love is also a world that has the possibility of evil. And in our world, that possibility of evil has very much been realized. Our first parents, as we know from divine revelation, chose against God and actualized evil with that gift of free will, which is given to them by God so that they could love him. But this is the dynamic of our free will. And we cannot be healed uh, against our will. Even when Jesus speaks to the paralytic, for example, who's lying on the mat next to the pools of Bethesda, he says to him, do you want to be healed? Okay, he needs the man's consent before he can act. So M. Scott Peck, the famous American psychiatrist, writes, even God cannot heal a person who does not want to be healed. At the moment of expulsion, both of these patients, he's talking about exorcism cases, voluntarily took the crucifix, held it to their chest, and prayed for deliverance. So let's talk about some pastoral takeaways here. Um, some... some uh, some uh, spiritual uh, um, action points that we can look at. Okay, first of all, do we realize that the Jubilee is perpetuated through the sacraments in a special way through reconciliation? In this morning's talk, we talked about Jesus as the divine Melchizedek who came to proclaim the unending Jubilee year perpetually marked by liberation from sin and from Satan. And all of the sacraments liberate us from Satan and liberate us from sin. Beginning with baptism, baptism itself includes an exorcism in the rite of baptism. So all the sacraments are like this, but especially confession, because it particularly aims at removing the consent that allowed evil to take place in our lives. So do we think of reconciliation in terms of jubilee, in terms of liberation, in terms of freedom? I think not. I think that we often have a rather dull and uh, judicial perspective on the sacrament of reconciliation. Again, do we think of confession in legal terms or in spiritual warfare terms? What about other people in our life? You know, what about family members, children, students, etc.? You know, are we conveying to those around us that reconciliation is not about judgment? And it's not about some kind of judicial action, but it's really about having victory in spiritual combat and attaining uh, the defeat of the evil one in our lives. And, uh, you know, what am I doing in terms of my own practice of this sacrament? Am I making frequent recourse to it? Now, I have never heard a spiritual um, a teacher advise less than monthly Okay, and I've heard several that have advised weekly confession. So somewhere between weekly and monthly, <coughs> pray about it. Talk to your spiritual director or somebody who's a trusted uh, spiritual guide or your pastor, but set up a practice of regular confession in your own life, and then you know become an apostle of confession to those around you. So are you making frequent use of reconciliation? Are you promoting it with those around you by your example and your teaching? And what about a general confession? Maybe some of us should ponder that. What about that ancient practice of making an annual retreat as a lay Catholic? Uh, and in that context of that retreat, making a thorough inventory, maybe using something like the guide for confession that Dominicans use 
for their parish missions, which is one of the best that I've ever seen. And using that to work through that and, um, and uh, spend some extra time with the priest and make that thorough in- inventory to get that spiritual healing that may be blocked because we haven't completely renounced the permissions that we've granted to the evil one to work in our life. Am I, am I educated on that issue? Uh, am I willing to make it a part of my own life and to know when it would be appropriate for others to take advantage of it as well? These are some things that we can ask ourselves. Let's go to the Lord in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this sacrament. We pray that uh, we would be equipped and empowered through the Holy Spirit to be evangelists of the sacrament of reconciliation, uh, to make frequent use of it ourselves, to understand its spiritual powers, to understand it in terms of spiritual warfare, and to promote this within our congregations, within our families, with all those who we come in contact. Lord, we pray for revival of the church in this country. We pray for revival in the church around the world. We pray for a spirit of repentance. We pray for a spirit of confession to fall upon the church worldwide so that we can experience the fruits of repentance and a springtime of evangelization. We pray this through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. We have some time for, for uh, questions. We have until about 3.15, so we've got about 12 minutes. we got a, a microphone as well. So wait till the microphone comes to you, and I'll do my best. Dr. Burge, uh, great talk. Uh, why does the Catholic Church allow uh, only, or, or say as a minimum, one time a year for confession? I can't imagine anyone really only wanting to go to confession once a year. So why is it allowed? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a great question. There's these these very, very minimal requirements that are placed by the church on us, you know, commune once a year, confess once a year. If you only follow those minimal requirements, that certainly is not enough to grow and um, and to flourish in the Christian faith. I imagine that the reason the church established these kind of minimal requirements as being so low is because of extreme situations like being in a distant country or on a desert island or something like this where you're, um, you know, you're you're physically prevented from getting to the sacraments and so uh, laying a a kind of a very low bar on the general populace. But uh, none of the none of the popes or the the spiritual uh, writers of the church would say that, you know, only doing those mental requirements is is anywhere near sufficient to actually grow in holiness like we're called to do so by the very nature of our baptism. Okay, so um, the church doesn't want to, uh, you know, lay uh, burdens. And there, there's also people that are in situations of, um, you know, uh, illness that are homebound and, and, and such. And so the church is very generous and you know, what's formally required, but on the other hand, uh, what, what's encouraged for those who are serious about growing in your baptismal grace is much more than that, okay? And, um, uh, that, you know, that's been made clear, you know, through, through the magisterium of the past several popes and, again, also from the writings of the saints. So thank you for that question. Um. <clears throat> When I went to seminary back in the early 80s, I mean early 90s, um, I had a Dominican Thomistic theology professor who really impressed on us that uh, being a priest in confession is uh, is to make judgments. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, I, I really would think that uh, confession is, is both about liberation, but also it's, it's a, well, it's kind of a tribunal, not in the Protestant sense that we're uh, snow-covered dung, but but that it's it's something uh, more, uh, you know, because when we make a judgment and I say, well, this is a sin or this isn't, you know, how do you explain yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. So there is that judicial 
aspect to confession. The priest does make, have to make a, a judgment about what constitutes a sin and be able to counsel the person that's come to them. But it's not an either or thing, you know. Um, and I, I guess I should qualify what I'm saying here. I'm not, it's not that I'm denying the judicial aspect of it, saying that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't count. But uh, I think for most lay people, if we get fixated on that, then going to the confession, you know, has, has all, the, all the joy and excitement of walking into a courtroom. <laughs> and when is that a fun experience? Uh, but when we realize that, you know, something ontological is happening here, something, something that has to do with, with, uh, with, the real, with spiritual reality, that we're getting unshackled, that we're getting un, unbound, that we're getting freed, uh, that we're experiencing victory over evil, that a huge step forward is taking place in, uh, in the spiritual life. That is a much more positive way to understand. And uh, <coughs> I don't, you know, again, I don't deny the judicial aspect. And I've gone to confession and I've opened, you know, bared my soul in front of the priest and said, you know, I'm trying to distinguish subtle movements of my spirit, you know, and was this a temptation or was this a sin? And <coughs> Father, do you think that by doing such and such, I was giving consent, you know? And so you examine those questions with the priest, and he's trained to do that. But still, my, my primary image when I go into the confessional is that I've given Satan permission to work in my life by what I've done, and I've got to renounce that quickly, okay? I don't want any time to elapse with, with uh, that, that permission being allowed and, and his activity within me. I want to put an end to that, and I want to get back on a firm footing where I have not, you know, I have not consented uh, to, to his activity within my soul. And the, the place that can rectify me and get me back to that good place is the sacrament of reconciliation. Okay. Other questions? Um, not so, I, I guess this is a question, but your, your whole topic of uh, spiritual warfare uh, resonated uh, big time with me. And one of the things that I've been thinking an awful lot about is nowhere is that more prevalent and or dangerous than in social media. Yeah. And, I, and I'm just wondering if the church or any writers or there's any literature kind of examining that battlefield of that warfare that that would be useful to read or to corroborate what what's going on in my mind on that topic right um yeah you're absolutely right there's a lot of demonic activity going on in social media we see this kind of you know very perverse group think among people that get onto the same sites and are kind of spreading um very unhealthy uh, downright perverse or evil ideas that kind of are like a like a spiritual virus that will spread within a within a group of people that get involved in the same sites. Uh, there's definitely some stuff going on there. Um, I regret to say I'm not well read on the literature specifically on you know spiritual warfare in the media, but I know people that are working in this area. My my good friend and colleague Eugene Gann, who teaches here, is an expert on Catholic use of the of media, and he's done some work and others as well. Uh, I know some exorcists um, and assistant exorcists who have talked about, uh, at least on a popular level, uh, the dangers that are posed by social media. I have to do some research or some scratching around, but I bet I could find some good articles for you. You can reach out to me at jbergsma at franciscan.edu. That's my, uh, that's my um, uh, email. Let me see if I can put this up on the screen for everybody. Um, yeah. Let's do it. Yep, you bet. Is that my title page? No, not that one. Uh, 
there it is. You can send, send me an email at that address and I'll scratch it on it, but I can find you some good stuff on that. Uh, yes, over here. All right, uh, with the topic of deliverance and confession, I found one uh, point missing, which also happened in Jesus' ministry as the apostles were uh, powerless of helping the boy who was possessed. And Jesus explained that uh, it was the prayer and the fasting. Yeah. And I think that the dimension of fasting as preparation for confession, it's one of important things for us as well. Uh, maybe uh, next time you can actually dwell a little bit longer on this. Right. I totally agree. Yeah, fasting. Um, and uh, fasting, you know, I would take that as a reference to more generally to a life of penitence. Okay. And uh, that's something that we've really gotten away from the value of a life of mortification, you know, a lifestyle of mortification where, where, we, where we are practicing small mortifications through the day. And this was much more common in Catholic piety in previous generations. And then we got kind of soft and silly uh, for a couple of decades here and uh, lost that sense that there have to be um, physical manifestations of our interior repentance for our sins. And the classic is, of course, fasting. You're absolutely right. And our Lord says at one point, these, these kind come out only by prayer and uh, fasting. So we need to get back to that. Um, I know during Lent, we, we have various uh, fasting practices, but fasting is not meant just for Lent. You know, Lent is where we intensify our personal mortifications, but we're meant to practice various forms of self-denial throughout the, you know, the entire year. St. Jose Maria Escriva, the saint whose spirituality I follow, recommended small mortifications that were relatively frequent. Things like, you know, skipping butter on your toast, skipping sugar in your coffee, making small acts of self-denial, uh, denying yourself by showing up on time and leaving on time from events, using good posture. He had whole lists and lists in his spiritual writings of small things that we could do. And the advantage that St. Jose Maria emphasized with these small things is that they were in little danger of leading to pride because nobody's going to be blown away that you skipped butter on your toast. It's like, whoa, now you're just like St. Lawrence and turn me over and cook me on the other side with that, that butter skipping of yours. You know? So these, these small mortifications can't lead to pride, yet they often require a great exertion of the will. It's surprisingly difficult to skip butter, you know? You'd think it was some kind of torture chamber. Like, yeah, you know, you're like, yeah, no, you know, I'm not going to spread out my toes. Um, but it, it really, they really exercise the will. And those, those small, uh, constant uh, mortifications uh, actually uh, serve very well to train and strengthen our will uh, for, for those times also that we encounter a great crisis where we have to make a large self-denial in order to choose the good and uh, to choose God. So thank you for, for uh, throwing that in. Yeah, prayer and fasting, the practice of mortification, very important. And we got to get back to that as a kind of Catholic lifestyle. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. And, uh, you can just choose where you want to with the microphone. Yeah, we'll choose uh, one more, one more question. So all confessions are not the same. So they say to keep on going to the same person to confess. Um, that's not always possible. And my second part of that is, like, if you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So if you go to a confession, is there a point where the priest is going to say, I'm not going to forgive you? Or you're not, you know, so, yeah. so I'm seeing this right from the Bible. Right. Um, so I'm yeah. just. Yes, uh, excellent question. Um, it is very rare, but if you go into the confessional and you don't manifest repentance and you don't convince the priest that you're really sorry for what you've done, uh, he can uh, decide to. Uh, deny you absolution. And that does happen, okay? 
uh, it's very rare, but some people will come in to the confessional and they're just brazen. And they haven't, <laughs> the fact that they're in the confessional means that they are trying or they, they know they need to confess it, but they have not let it go. And they're in the confessional and they just say it and they, they can't manifest contrition to the priest. And the priest will have to say, look, I sense or I, you know, or I can tell that you're not contrite, that you're not sorry for having done this, and I can't grant you absolution. Okay, so the priest has to see evidence of contrition uh, from the penitent in order to grant absolution, and sometimes it just isn't there. Um, in general, it is best to have a regular confessor who gets to know your soul uh, and can, and can kind of get a sense of your progress and maybe can give you personalized guidance and, and so on rather than always going to a different person where you're just walking in cold and it's anonymous. However, it's also good periodically to switch things up and go to a different confessor because confessors have different strengths and different charisms and so on. And occasionally it's good to, to go to a, a different priest who may be able to sense something different about your soul and, and um, you know, give you advice in a different area. So consistency is good and occasional variety is also good in the practice of, uh, of confession. So. All right, thank you so much for your questions.